Oxiani School of Medicine, also a professor of cell biology at New York University School of Medicine. He founded the New York University Quran Bioinformatics Groups. This is a multidisciplinary group working on research at the interface of computer science, applied mathematics, biology, biomedicines, and bio nanotechnology. May I now invite Professor Bhumneswar Mishra to start? Okay. Should I wait for the other people? Please start, sir. Okay. All right. I'm, I think this is the last talk of the conference. So I'm going to tell the story. So, uh, first of all, um, this is the first time I'm talking about cybersecurity. I've never worked in this field until like a year ago. Um, I've done work on various things that are related, I guess. So, as I tell people, I work on bad things. So, hardware verification, finding bugs, cancer, malaria, pathogen, post pathogen interactions. So, cybersecurity seems like something in that kind of. Yesterday, I was like calling me. Later. So I'm going to start with um, this particular um, story. Actually, sometimes I call this the first time house to our house. Um, so this is a attack that was launched um, by Cyberbunker in March 2013. This was a small dispute between uh, Span House and Cyberbunker, but that uh, resulted in a distributed denial of services that was massive. And the question was, um, what can be done? If you go back and look at all the details, um, sounds like there were a lot of small mistakes that sort of blew up. Spam House had um, blacklisted Cyberbunker, Cyberbunker hit back, um, Spam House then went to Cloudflare, they were supposed to use tier two, they used tier one. Also. But instead of thinking of it as a technology problem, I'm going to think of it as a really um, more of a human problem, from a game theory. So I'm going to start with talking about game theory. Um, so the art of war. Um, so this is the, let your clients regard the impenetrable as night, and when you move, fall by the thunderbolt. So the idea of game theory is non cooperative So what you say does not matter. It's the revelation principle, the actions you take. Those are the most important. And that are totally related to your payoff matrix. So that's the classic of game theory. So uh, these are the famous heroes of game theory. One of them, Marvin Stern, Nash. But we'll come back to the philosopher David Lewis, because we'll use his thing. This is David Lewis. Um, called Singhali Games. That will play a big role in the way we'll think about um, various problems, some in computer science, but a lot in biology. So we'll go back and forth between how biology has tried to solve this problem. Similar problems. A lot of the questions that are coming up in engineering, um, signaling, privacy, attacks, um, a lot of those questions have been taken up by biology for about four and a half million years, four million years at least. And uh, mostly in the last 150 million years or so since Cambrian radiation, because multicellular already got much more complex. There's a lot of data on how the cells talk to each other and what they do to each other. So we'll steal some of those ideas. So the classical games, we think of them as non-cooperative games in the sense there's nothing for them to coordinate. Sometimes there's zero-sum games, but not always. But um, what I'm interested in is what I call asymmetric or information asymmetric games. So there, you have two agents. One agent is the informed agent, and the other one is the un uninformed agent. And they communicate to establish some sort of coordination some sort of activities. And classically also people thought about one-shot games, where one-shot games are not very interesting, also very hard to interpret with, because a lot of the game theory use probabilities, so the mixed strategies, and they are better explained either in a repeated game or in the context of populations, where two players meet randomly, either pan or meet in some coordinated way. So we'll 
look into that. And again, um, there are various things such as normal form and extensive form games. Again, in non-cooperative games, normal forms are okay, but asymmetric games are best understood in extensive uh, form games where you uh, coordinate your moves. Okay. In the matrix games, in the normal form games, both players play simultaneously. And what sort of makes all of this very beautiful is that there's a concept of equilibrium and under mixed strategies, under very mild conditions, you can always achieve Nash equilibrium. So all, all these games have that property and it follows from a fixed point here and very, very simple assumptions. So um, how many of you know game theory? Okay, some people don't, so I'm going to just uh, tell you what they are. So you have a set of players, which is given by index set i, and we'll assume that there are n players. Each agent has a set of choices. So games, uh, another way of thinking of game theory is it's a dynamics of strategy choices. So all agents have set of strategies, and their ability to use a free will or epistemology or evolutionary forces to select an action. Okay, we're not going to take that away. But when you choose a strategy, when you make a choice, um, there are some outcomes. And what you get paid, your payoff metrics, your utilities, are dependent on, those, uh, uh, on your choice of the strategy and the strategies chosen by all the other players. So it's a point in strategy profile, and that gives you the payoff. So all the players make their own strategy choices. Together, they result in an outcome. The outcome distributes some utilities to people. Okay? Is that clear or no? So as a society, we may have social contract. There may be some ways of us to think about privacy. Some have data, some don't. And we share in some way. We make a study choice what to give, what to take, and that has some utilities, and the utilities are just distributed equal. Some win, some, right? So many times social contracts, and what we choose as policies, are governed to make a better social utility, something better for the society. In the biological context, it would be group selection, because if, even if each individual makes good selective choices, the group may not have selective advantage. In that case, the group selection forces will, work, will act against that. Okay. So um, this is why there are institutions and higher social contracts. In computer science, we don't think of what we do that way. Think of them as engineering problem, but we're going to go back and think about it more carefully. So here is a very simple game. There are two players. I'm the matcher. You are the mismatcher. And we have to choose head or tail. If we both choose head, I'm a matcher, I get paid. If I choose head, you choose tail, they do not match, the mismatcher gets a pair of one unit. So um, the role player here is the mismatcher. So if they come matching head and head, he gets minus one. The column player is a <coughs> matcher, head and head, he gets one. Right? Now, what I want is a choice of strategies so that given my opponent, my adversary is choosing something, I should choose the best response to them. And similarly, my opponent is going to make his best choice, assuming that I'm making my best choice. That's where the fixed points are. And here, of course, you get into a paradoxical result if you want to choose a pure strategy, because if I am a matcher, I choose head. As a mismatcher, you will choose tail, and that says I should have chosen tail. Right? So there's no um, pure strategy equilibrium, but the simple thing to do is to choose a mixed strategy. Choose either of those with equal probability. Right? So matcher chooses head or tail, the 50 50 independent draw, mismatcher does the same thing. So half the time matcher wins, the other half the time mismatcher wins. So they have Expected pair will be zero. <coughs> Clear enough. So there is an Nash equilibrium once I come to mixed strategy. One could think of player one and player two 
it has an extensive form case. So that means player one goes, and of course this doesn't work because player two can see what player one has done. So one way to do that is to put a veil of ignorance, hide the move. So player two will make his move after player one has made, but does not know what player one has made. So you do have asymmetry here, but you can get rid of asymmetry very easily. Other games that you may have heard of is the business dilemma. I'm not going to go into it. But um, again, there are some interesting things you see that globally I can see that certain choices would be optimal. But based on very simple argument of Taking only dominating choices, you'll see that they will end up with something slightly suboptimal. So there are also some crazy things that can occur, but um, this is the way one thinks about how we make our strategy choices in a collective setting. So I'm not going to beat this up too much. Um, again, the same thing happens if I turn it into an extensive. So I'm going to next move to asymmetric games. And the interesting things about asymmetric games is there is a room for deception. And deception is quite interesting. Uh, but Tony said, I thought to myself, with what means, with what deceptions, with how many varied arts, with what industry a man sharpens his wits to deceive another. And through these variations, the world is made more beautiful. So deceptions also make the world very beautiful. So here is the classical signaling game. There's a sender, sender is the informed agent, and the receiver is the uninformed. Sender sees the states, the types, receiver does not. Sender takes the state of the world, the type of the world, sends a signal. Comes up, comes down, right? Zero, one, or some other signal from a small alphabet. One can go into the arguments about how those alphabets should be chosen. And based on that, the receiver chooses an action. Right. And they have utilities. Sender has a utility that depends on the state of the world, the message he sends, and the action the receiver takes. Similarly, the receiver has a utility that depends on the state of the world, the message he receives, and the action he takes. But I'm not going to assume that they're the same utility. Or there's any other way of them to agree on a utility. Right? Is this clear or not? So, um, <clears throat> but you can show that even if I do that, there is a Nash equilibrium, but some of them are pretty bad. One kind of Nash equilibrium that's very easy to obtain are called pooling equilibrium. That means he looks at the world, he sends a message, the receiver ignores, does one thing, even if there are many choices. Another is babbling equilibrium, which is he sees a state, sends something totally randomly, and the receiver chooses a random action. The better ones are when the state and the actions are coordinated. That means for particular states, he does set up particular actions so that the utilities are maximized. And the states and the actions get coordinated. Those are the separating equilibria. Even if you get separating equilibria, there is a little bit of a problem, because there is a real objective probability distribution here, where the states are distributed in some way. He sends set of messages. He does action. Each time he does action, he gets a utility. From the utility, he can calculate, even if he doesn't know the state of the world, he can calculate a subjective probability distribution in the world. And the interesting thing is that the objective dis uh, probability distribution and the subjective distribution need not coincide because they depend on the utilities. And that I'm going to call deception. The amount by which the value is the deception. So I have a bunch of private information. I give you part of it based on that you guess, because I have black or white. You show me something. But there is the entity that's showing me something has a particular knowledge, particular uh, subjective probability distribution on the state of the world. How 
various groups interact. Or so that's the deception. And here is an example. So that's Barack Obama. That's his sign language translator. So the problem is that nobody actually asked the sign language translator whether you can in no sign language in the sign language. If they had, they would have liked it. So this is you can think of it's a very easy to model this in this signal easy. Um, so this is the picture. Um, this is not a separating equilibrium, but it's a pretty good equilibrium because there is a babbling equilibrium here, and there is some sort of redundancy. And uh, people studied this in the context of evolution of languages. So sometimes you can think of these as synonyms, and these are some ambiguous sentences. But the ideal situation would be when the signals are well coordinated and you have separating equilibrium. And the dynamics you need to coordinate them, there's lots of work on it. And sometimes you can get good separating equilibrium, but most of the times you should be getting the bad ones. So you get something that's a combination of separating and pulling equilibrium. Okay. Everybody with me so far? And here is a simple game where there are two states, A and B, and the actions are uh, two actions, either you do x, so it does x, does not do x. And they can play these games where they uh, choose certain coordination between the signal and the action, but depending on the their utility functions, how they're ready, they can move to interpretation. And they can come to two Nash equilibrium, one here and the one over there, they're essentially symmetric in the sense the meaning of A and B could be reversed, and that's also a good equilibrium. So this is why A and B have no specific meaning. These are also called conventional equilibrium. And so if I change the meaning of dog and cat, it doesn't really make any difference as long as everybody coordinates. Right? Okay. Uh, what is the first, very first example of a good signaling game? about um, 4 billion years ago. So this was the RNA world. So you had microRNA, sorry, um, messenger RNA, phosphor RNA, so on and so forth. And they get invaded by amino acids. So we got a paper on this um, about how the genetic codes, which could be seen, seen as a signaling game, could have evolved. We know that the genetic codes are conventional. We also know they are universal, that means all living creatures have the same genetic code, with small exceptions in case of mitochondria. And there are some fungi, like um, Candida albicans. But more or less, we use this exactly the same genetic code. It's immutable. It's extremely stable. Under evolution, it does not change. And it is very close to optimal in terms of information theory error tolerance. So the question had um, occurred how this could have evolved by itself. And there was only one surviving theory that's due to Francis Crick. And the theory was, it's a frozen accident. An accident happened and it froze. It's not a good theory, but that's the best we had. But in case of a signaling game, you could explain this fairly easily as a separating equilibrium. And it's a good, very good, stable Nash equilibrium. That's why it's not easy to um, to cause mutation to that, to changes to this code. But it also has deception. For example, messenger RNA can actually induce transfer RNA to make multiple copies of the genes, which turned out to be a good thing because evolution by duplication is a very key thing in our evolutionary system. But also, it allows you other things like viruses, retroviruses, to hijack the whole system. Right? So electroviruses can actually deceive the system to do something like incorporate it into DNA. And there's nothing you could have done. There's no best practices, policies that you could have thought of to create a genetic code that's good and takes you to a protein world and stops these other things. Okay. What is the game here? The game here? So the game here is uh, the amino acids come, 
right? So amino acids are highly toxic to that RNA world environment. So they have to be moved out of the system, and the job is usually transfer RNA job. So the guess is that they strung together amino acids to short polymers. And if you make it in a way, if it is random or homopolymers, if it's babbling or pulling, it's not good. Because you don't get the same hydrophilic hydrophobic effects. So they have to be strung together in certain way to actually dissolve and get out of the system. So originally, we created proteins as a toxic thing to get out of the system. But as we make longer and longer things, they have enzymatic uses. So now we went from a hate-hate relationship to some love-hate or some other kind of relationship. Did I answer your question? So the code that we came up with, which froze, was because we got into a situation when we figured out how to use proteins. And also, the initial amino acids were about five or six. So there are um, biotic. We synthesized some of the amino acids. And in principle, there could have been something like 85 different amino acids that we could have created and used when we stopped at about 21. Some of them used 22. And the reason is that's good enough to get you this equilibrium. And once you get to this stable equilibrium, it's very hard to change it. In the laboratory, by tweaking the system one amino acid at a time, you can actually change the genetic code. But it has to be done in a very specific way to get the mRNA and tRNA to coordinate in different genetic code. So this paper um, appeared in the interface, and uh, the intelligent designers wrote a blog attacking us. So we became famous for five minutes. So um, we got invited by the ethics to talk about this. Because it didn't look very good. So it looks much more complex to have emerged by itself. Okay. But it's not a perfect system, because we know that it is somewhat deceptive. It's not completely optimal. But it's very close to optimal. Um, OK. Here's another example, mate selection. So um, in many species, in almost all species, the females pick the males. So uh, often they pick by some pleiotropic effects of the traits. So one simple one is um, male, so the females want to pick males that are big in size. If you are big in size, then you will have a deep voice. So deeper the voice, without seeing you, I can make an inference that you have your deep voice, your face. So if you do mate calls, the females are going to be attracted to the mate calls that are deep voices because they expect the mate, the male, to be big. What does the male do? Evolve deep voices and get smaller. So that's the kind of deception you would get. But then you would say, why would the females choose this? Like ultimately, it should be bad. Deception is bad. But the females, if they have sexy sons, sons who are small but have deep voice, she has an advantage. Actually, the, de the deception works to her advantage if she is willingly deceived. So this is called the sexy son hypothesis. And that results in a lot of radar isolation, such as pickled scale, and lots of these pleiotropic effects. OK? So deception comes in many forms. <coughs> Used car markets. Used cars, good cars, lemons. Right? They're mixed up. They're all made to look good. And um, if you are a buyer, um, a good car is more, more than a bad one. The dealer knows quality, but you don't. You cannot tell a good car from a bad one, but believe a proportion of two cars are good. You need to decide whether to buy or not, and so on and so forth. So again, here there's a signaling game. There's a buyer, there's a sender, there's a receiver. There are different utilities, and uh, these kinds of problems. Uh, this is actually, sorry, this is so the classical economic game people talk about. Another game people talk about often is an interviewer and an interviewee. Interviewee knows the skill sets he has. Interviewer is trying to choose the one that fulfills the skill set. Right. So again, one is informed, the other one is uninformed, but they have to make decisions, give a job or not, but they are different utilities to maximize. 
Here's another example, bitcoins. You receive some number of bitcoins from a sender in the form of an electronic message. These bitcoins can be added to your bitcoin wallet. Only the sender knows whether the transaction is valid. Because he knows if he has enough money in his bitcoin wallet. Um, he may repudiate the transaction, could say that I didn't send it. Or uh, he could have simultaneously made several transactions. Right? Again, there's a room for deception. Another example, malware. We can receive a free app from an app store. The app developer knows whether the app is beneficent or malicious, but you don't. There's a free app. You can download it. You must decide what action to take it. Take it, either ignore it, download the app, download and test, give the developer a reputation score, etc. So trust and everything. Your privacy, all these questions are part of here, right? So is that an engineering way of getting rid of deception? But by again, deception means that your objective reality and subjective reality should match. The probability distributions that you compute should match. You need mechanisms to do it. So how does biology do that? So one idea is to make the game costly. Signaling is costly. It's called the handicap principle. So that if you make a false signal, you get caught, it has a huge cost. If it doesn't, this is also called the cheap talk game. Talk is cheap. Right? So in Bitcoin's case, what do we do? This is from Kautilya, from 3rd century BC. Is India's Machiavelli, so we are proud that we preceded Machiavelli by something like uh, 2,000 years. Um, so, so one idea is to this handicap principle, make signals costly to the signaler, costing the signal something that could not be afforded by a player with less of a particular threat, particular set of information. Um, and we do that by having regulators, institutions, so on and so forth. And we have mechanisms to regulate the regulators, check, all that. Right? But that's one. Another is credible and non-credible threats. So you do something, you'll be punished if you're caught. Right? So if you, um, and non-credible threats are threats that are not credible, that may or may not be possible for you to exercise. Examples of religion. There's somebody watching you, um, and he will punish you on the resurrection day, or something like that. As long as you believe that, that could work. From you, stop you from doing deceptive signal. Another is to turn it into three-player games. There's a sender and a receiver, but there is a verifier that works together with the system. So he watches every time it goes. So in case of uh, used car salesman, you may have an engineer who can test it, or you can go for a test drive. So there's some sort of verification system. So the question is, can you combine this to make games that are significantly better? So in Bitcoin's um, examples, there's costly signaling. Uh, sorry, there's honest signaling. So based on a public key crypto system, you can um, you, you can check that the signal is coming from the right sender. So the sender has a um, private key and a public key, the public key crypto system. He signs his message with his private key, and every, anybody can verify it, and has all the things like his Bitcoin wallet and all that has. So it can be immediately verified. Right? Um, you also need to do not just the local verification, but some sort of global verification. That means he has many, many transactions that you can go back in time and check that they actually are consistent. So you create this hash checks. And to do that, you need a Bitcoin miners. So a group of people, your social network or some anonymous agents, they actually do this so they can be verified. But on top of that, you want to make the signal costly so that the Bitcoin miners themselves are not being deceptive. And so you put expensive proof of work every time you do. Is this clear? So we're going to introduce something like M coins. 
And M coins are going to be very similar to Bitcoins, but they are going to be, uh, unlike a circulating money, they are trust coins and they expire. But they can be used for credible threats and be used by the verifiers to create hash chains that can be verified, such as something like an audit trap. Okay? So you'll have all the transactions recorded there. Okay. So it is double pleasure to deceive the deceiver. So how do you deceive the deceiver? Uh, that was my favorite. My favorite. <laughs> so one of the things we have to do is to break the asymmetry. So in this example of the apps, I have a natural asymmetry. I'm going to break that. I'm going to introduce this bit uh, M coins. Everybody has some amount of M coins. And that's based on the attack surface, the trusted hardware, all sorts of things that we check for vulnerability. And if he proves that, he has enough M coins. And when he makes transactions, either the party can take it in trust or he can challenge. If he challenges, he has to be paid by M coins. If you don't have M coins, you are punished. So it's a credible threat. Okay. So similar ideas. You have a third part on the very files who are sort of behind the endpoints. You have costly signaling. And um, and you have broken the symmetry. So broken the asymmetry. So I've turned this into somewhat symmetric here. Not complete, but we have to look through that. Yeah? Okay. So um, let's look at the payoff matrix. There's a sender and a receiver. And the uh, minus parameter A is the cost of app, B is the value of app, C is the cost of verification, D is the benefit of hack, uh, cost of getting caught, the benefit of catching a malicious user, and the cost of challenging sent. So you can then Compute each time there's a transaction, the payoff matrix of the utilities now depend on all these costs. And by adjusting these costs, by making the challenge more expensive or the points more expensive, you can find different payoff matrices. Okay. So, what we want here is a Nash equilibrium in which you are good, you know you are good, you can prove you are good. You know that the other player is good. You know that the other player can prove he's good. You know the other player um, knows that he's good. You know the other player knows that he, I know that he, uh, I'm good, so and so forth. There's a knowledge and common knowledge. And most of the times, the transaction should happen without any challenge. But, but if there's a mutant, a new attacker emerges, the system should bring it back to the stable equal. So um, it's easier to look at it as a two rounds, and you get this complicated pair of metrics. And so we're going to see how stable this system is. So the M coins and all these things we have in the system have no intrinsic value. They're all conventional. They're all signals. But the um, idea is to let everybody fight over these things, because they can be used for credible threats. Um, so there's some interesting ideas. So what we do is, um, it's a very classical strategy used by biologists and game theorists. What we do is to we populate the strategy space by various strategies in the repeated game and then encode it as finite automata. So um, the people in SEI and Air Force came up with the acronyms. So I do not know all the acronyms. But some of them are well known. Uh, this is tit for tat, something. Um, it's a green. So tit for tat would be, I send you something, you challenge, and I challenge you. Right? And then I keep challenging everybody. You could be paranoid in the sense you challenge everybody. You could be green, you are good, you're cooperative. But once you are full, you challenge everybody after that. So, so everybody can mute it at any time and come up with different strategy space. And the whole population can populate these strategies to create a stratified population. 
Then it's very biological and it's structured. Okay. There's a notion of identity. There's a notion of identity, yes. In this, but it's hard to challenge malware, right? Here, so. Right. In this case, every player has its own identity. So, and you challenge somebody. Without identity, you can't get on a set of endpoints. So um, that's hard to make. Right. It doesn't have to be connected to your true identity, and you've got multiple anonymous uh, players playing for you. So that's all allowed. Um, and I think you can also take over somebody's identity and play as him, like in a zombie, but, but then that can be challenged. Right. As long as they don't have endpoints, the game is OK. Right. So, Identity is tied to who gets the endpoints, and the endpoints do not, do not have to be given by a central authority. It could be like points. Um, it's a peer-to-peer -peer network that can control. There's some um, tricky stuff, which is who gets how much endpoints. In some sort of, it would be bad if Google gets only 10 endpoints, and I get 10. So there's a way to distribute that, and that has to be learned through some sort of graph Laplaces. So I will not talk about that. I'm assuming that everybody is more or less equal and everybody can interact with everybody. We'll change those assumptions and the game becomes more complex. So here is the simulation system that was built at time k equal to zero. You have n players, so it's sort of like an evolution of this table system, ESS kind of games. And we assume it's parametric. That means any player can play with any player. So there's no network. But we'll coordinate the correlation of encounter. That I can choose to play with somebody over and over again. So if I want to buy books from Amazon and I like it, there's a probability that says how often I'll go back to Amazon. And also, um, what strategies I will select. So there are two parameters, delta and alpha. Alpha says um, how long I'll stay with the encounter game I'm playing with somebody, and um, uh, alpha is the strategy I'm going to select and stay with the strategy. Okay. Um, so what we're going to do is to look at uh, this. So they play this game every round, and they have this endpoints, a challenge based on these uh, strategies. But occasionally, they can mutate and change the strategy by adding a new transition or a new state and change that over. And if that strategy succeeds, it, up, it has the uh, advantage of populating the, uh, the population to have probability. Okay. So how to choose the new game? Um, right now, we'll play with me. So we'll look at all possible values of delta, alpha, mu, and also the parameters in the pair of metrics, the cost and the amount by which you can be punished. Penalties. So we'll see that space. Not all possible parameters are equally good. So here is some set of parameters. Um, these are various cost functions, and then the parameters delta, alpha, and various fixed units. So what you see is um, under some very heavy punishment, they essentially break up into two populations. But under some other uh, constraints, you can see very, very complex populations, like this one. There are at least 10, 15 strategies all living within the space. Okay. Um, of course, when delta and alpha are high, close to one, that means you're essentially playing the game with partner over and over. So repeat that game with your opponent selected and remaining the same which you should expect to get better. And the other parameters are um, how quickly you go back to the nice Nash equilibrium, just the blue region. And um, what you see is, in many such parameters, a very sharp phase transition. That means the areas where um, the constant challenges and very costly, as the parameters move, there's a phase transition where essentially everybody becomes good. There's no advantage to being creating malware or being challenged 
That's it. So most of the times, these coins will not be used, and the system will be very simple. Okay. So um, I don't have the time to show these movies. They have actually created also movies where you start with the population being nice. One guy becomes a mutant, starts introducing malware or attacking, and you see that moving forward. And then there are challenges, and you see this really complex dynamics. And they go back to the nice Nash equilibrium. So, uh, of course, there's more to it, um, which I'm not going to talk about. There are all sorts of other vulnerability analysis, threat analysis that actually prompts the people when to challenge. So, again, you can put this on a network, and essentially, if there is an attack originating somewhere, you'd see essentially the verifiers getting closer to that thing and stopping it and getting back to the system. So the, Spatial and temporal paths play a big role in keeping it contained. The nice thing about the strategy of this approach is that most of the times you're not wasting any resources, other than periodically providing endpoints that are expired. Because most of the times you're not doing anything bad to anybody. Okay. So, um, so there's a lot of work here that, uh, because um, the phylogenies of malware, people keep track of it, and they help the system to get better. So if you want peace, you should prepare for war. Um, I'm going to skip this. But there are some um, interesting um, sort of viewpoints. This strategy differs from the sort of accepted uh, common sense, common views. Um, the idea is that the current approaches should be static. That means there are some best practices. We should give it to all the large institutions. They should follow it. We're saying there's no best practice. Evolve your own and populate it. Um, everybody should use the same best practice. No. Be as heterogeneous as your adversaries. Um, Current approaches are expensive, proposing something very fast, cheap, and out of control, just like your adversaries. Uh, Current approaches are transparent. You reveal your best practices to the whole world, including your adversaries. It says, don't do that. Um, uh, keep the adversaries guessing your next step. Because if they come up with something, you'll come up with a new set of strategies automatically. So, so that's sort of fun for me, because it actually looks and feels like biology, like people look at it and think of immune systems, but that was not by design. Um, so uh, there's a lot more work going on. So I think that's where I can start. Oh, um, in general, I'm very interested in signaling games. Um, they come up with multicellularity more often than the simpler games that I showed with the Gordons. Um, examples are cancer because a lot of cancer signaling, especially signaling because it's between cancer stem cells and progenitor cells, is fairly complex. Because the stem cells are creating progenitor cells, and progenitor cells have to send a signal back saying they're overcrowded, stop the wire. Right? So, so stem cells can do the action of dividing, but have no way of finding how crowded the density of the organ. So in the development, that coordination is important, and cancer is probably the main cause where that coordination goes away. In neuroscience, especially in autism, there's some very interesting questions, even in olfactory systems, related to what's called monoallelic exclusion. Of the two copies of a gene of two different alleles, often one allele is shut down. Only one copy works. And that has been done to coordinate something similarly. Also, plants use that, the male and female of the different species and fool each other. So the way they coordinate is they have to actually send a whole bunch of genes from the same body uh, the chromosome so that the female can actually check. So there are also some complex systems. And also immune systems has many examples of similar signaling and deception. 
But I'm also interested in um, understanding computer science as we build a large scale system. What can we design that will have this? I mean, we'll have deception, but at least we know the deception. So um, the examples in machine learning, uh, because the idea that uh, there is some fixed risk function or loss function, so quadratic loss function that you optimize is not making sense. Uh, there are more complex loss functions that come up if, in addition to bias variance, you also look at the difference in the um, probability distributions. We saw examples of cybersecurity. Uh, markets, market microstructures have many examples of these kinds of things, and you could actually design much better uh, finance systems if you pay attention to this. And I have some obsessive project that I've been calling Glass Bit Games. I'm not going to tell much more about it. Glass Bit Games is the name of a book by Herman Hesse, also called Magister Ludwig, where he proposes a signaling system that's designed to be honest. So I'm going to stop here. I don't know if it was a computer science talk or a biology talk. I think it was a biology talk. Any question? Again, go ahead. Yeah, if you go back to that slide, okay. go back to the slide where you have how we differ, and I want to. Okay. I want you to try to defend yourself. Sure. <laughs> Actually, there, there's just like a week ago, there's a new report by Libiki. He is actually proposing a lot of similar things, going back to vulnerability to threat and those things. Yeah, yeah. For each one of those, I have some uh, questions. Okay. So, first of all, when you say current approach or staffing, there's vulnerability analysis. That's addressing a very different kind of problem, right? Software does not have the continuous behavior of means. You have one bug and all hell breaks loose. And there is only a little bit of work on things like artificial software diversity. But so behind software, I'm assuming that humans also will have diversity and will create things. Yeah, but you know, people have tried to build end version systems, and humans are remarkably similar. They make the same kind of bugs. The independence that you expect from from fault for fault tolerance, the independence assumptions often work, but for security, they're largely uh, broken. It just doesn't work. Oh, but but, but, are you saying that the kinds of attacks do not have diversity? The systems themselves are very, the attacks don't have to be diverse. The same attack will work on all the systems. So, well, all the systems. I mean, are you, so one question I have is because I'm not an expert in this, but I work with you. Say, for example, mobile malware, the apps, which is the example I use. Um, do all the malware apps work in the same way? There are no diversity, they're not designed that well, way. Yeah, you can have diversity in the attack, but I'm talking about the defense. Right, so, so I'm saying the You're defense saying could be as diverse as that. But how? It's One is to create strategy. Well, well, the simple idea is to create a strategy when you challenge that. In the reputation systems and other ways. Reputation systems you might be able to do, but right. the software, is, you might not have persistent identities, right? If I'm a malware writer, I'll write every app with a different identity. I won't let you build up a pattern. Right, but here I'm tying your identity to this cross points, end points, right? So you have to have that. So imagine I have a new app store and I have app developers and I'm giving them identities because only if they have this points can give and they can be challenged by the buyers. And you have a persistent identity. I'll have a persistent identity in my app store, right. right. I can go on no, no, no. Well, okay. we'll get a drink.